Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus, and I trust that that will be an encouragement and a blessing to you. Uh, I want to share a couple of announcements uh, as we begin. Uh, first of all, uh, this coming week, uh, we have the building stuff is beginning to take place more and more. Uh, if you could be in prayer about that. And then when the construction company begins, the steps at some point are going to be taken out. So we'll be finding other ways to get to the other side of the building. But please be aware of the uh, shuffling changes that we have to make as we uh, adjust to that. But we praise the Lord for the progress to date. Uh, if you have an opportunity, you can go and look at what's being done. And you'll be seeing it pretty soon every Sunday right here in front of us as they put the lift in. But please be in prayer for that. Also, um, if you note the events coming up, uh, this Wednesday night is the ladies' Uh, Bible study and the men's Bible study at 6 o'clock. Everyone is invited to that. Uh, also, the moms group is meeting on the 12th. If you want more information on that, you can see Nan. And then also December 17th, we have the Christmas caroling, and anyone from the church can be a part of that. And they may be splitting into two groups. Uh, the places that uh, have been ministered to in the past are looking forward to the church coming back uh, and singing and ministering to them again this year. So mark that on your calendar if you'd like to be a part of that. There'll be a lunch after church and then um, the caroling in two different or two or three different spots. Uh, also today we're going to do something a little uh, different. Um, after the uh, prelude, we're going to remember one of our church members who've been called home. Uh, we've done that in the past with different members, and I'll just share a few thoughts uh, as we rejoice in what God has done for us.
Uh, when Donna's father passed away a couple weeks ago, I know many of you asked if we would have a service here, and the family had their service in Pennsylvania. Uh, but we can share just a few thoughts, and I also want to thank the church for your prayer, support, and all that you've done for Donna and her family at this time. And one of the things about uh, her father, uh, he emphasized the faithfulness of God. Uh, his favorite verses were from Lamentations chapter 3. And in Lamentations 3, verse 22, it says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Those were his favorite verses, and it went along with his favorite song, which was, Great is thy faithfulness, that hymn. And I'll just read the words to the song, and I think if you knew uh, Donna's father, you'd see why these are so special to him. Uh, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Verse 2, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. And he loved God's creation, uh, taking pictures uh, to show the glory of God and the faithfulness of God. And verse 3, pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. And certainly uh, when we think of losing our loved ones, a member from the church, uh, we want to remember the faithfulness of God. And that's what they would want us to do as they are rejoicing in heaven with the Lord. And there's a uh, list of verses where uh, I've used this before, and you sub in the person's name. And as I read through the verses and put his name in, uh, think about the faithfulness of God when someone we love passes away and goes into the presence of their Savior. Uh, Don Faust, known to God in eternity. Before I formed Donald Faust in the womb, I knew him. Before he was born, I sanctified him. Jeremiah 1.5 Donald Faust chosen by God to salvation before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.3-6 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed Donald Faust, with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose him in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined him to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made Donald Faust accepted in the beloved. Donald Faust's salvation secured by Jesus Christ. And he died for Donald Faust, that he should no, live no longer for himself, but for him who died for him and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Donald Faust created to live out God's plan for his life. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for Donald Faust, when as yet there were none of them. Psalm 139, 14 to 16. Donald Faust, born a sinner, saved by grace. And Donald Faust he made alive who was dead in trespasses and sins, for by grace he was saved through faith, and that not of himself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest he should boast. For he is his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared Donald Faust beforehand that he should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 1, 8 through 10. Donald Faust ran the race for his Savior and Lord. For I am ready being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the face, faith, race, I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. Donald Faust has left his earthly vessel. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those like Donald Faust who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Donald Faust has been ushered into heaven. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saint. Psalm 116, verse 15. Donald Faust's body awaits the resurrection. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. By God's sovereign choice, Donald Faust has and always will be the object of God's love. Who shall separate Donald Faust from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all things, Donald Faust is more than a conqueror through him who loved him. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate Donald Faust from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 35 to 39. He would want you to be focused on the faithfulness of God. God is faithful to his own. He's faithful to the ones that he loves. And it's not a time for sorrow to rule the day, but it's a time for hope to rule the day. That our God is faithful. And what he has for us, what he's promised for us in Christ Jesus is eternity with him. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Praise God for that. And as we think of the Christmas season and we think the purpose for Christ's coming was what? To secure our salvation, uh, to go to the cross, to make the promises of God's word very real. Uh, to all of us who have known Christ's saving grace. And so as you think of um, one another, as we think of those who have gone on before us, don't lose sight of the faithfulness of God and the promises of God in his word. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the salvation that we have in Christ. We thank you for the promises that you have given us in Christ. Because Jesus died, because he rose again, because he lives, we too shall live. And Lord, as we enter into this Christmas season, as we uh, remind ourselves, as we look to the word of God, as we sing songs, we pray, Lord, that we would remember that Jesus Christ came the first time uh, to serve, to die for our sins, to make it possible for us to rejoice even in the times of death, knowing 
that our loved ones have gone on before us and that you have secured their salvation, you have defeated death, uh, there is no power uh, in death. And Lord, we just thank you for all that we have in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for each one here this morning. And we pray that you would fill our hearts with the joy that is found in knowing Christ, the joy that is found in singing about his coming uh, to provide this wonderful salvation. And then, Lord, as we open the word of God this morning, we pray that our hearts would be encouraged, that we would be reminded of this great plan of salvation. May it cause us to marvel, to be in amazement of what you have done to bring glory to yourself through Jesus Christ in the salvation of sinners. Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged in our faith, our hearts would be stirred to give you all the glory and all the praise, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All is calm and all is bright everywhere, but in your heart tonight, they're singing carols of joy and peace. But you feel too far gone and too far out of reach. Somewhere in your silent night, heaven hears the song your broken heart has cried. Hope is here, just lift your. From heaven's height to manger low, there is no distance, the Prince of Peace won't go. From manger low to Calvary's hill, when your pain runs deep, his love runs deeper still. He has always loved you, child, and he always will. Somewhere in your silent night, heaven hears the song night heaven hears the song your broken heart has cried hope is here just lift your head for love has come to find you somewhere in your silent night love will find you Truly, it is a blessing to know Christ, and I trust as we continue in the Word of God, as we enter into the Christmas season, that your heart, your mind will be filled with more and more of the salvation that you have in Christ and what God has done uh, in sending Christ and Him laying down His life for us and the great hope that we have of someday being with Him and like Him. And it's interesting to me in preparing uh, these messages from Matthew, and we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 1 this morning. Uh, the more you study God's Word, the more you see of the salvation that we have in Christ, uh, the more that it causes just utter amazement 
to see this is what God has done. This is what God has planned. This is what he will do to bring glory to his name. And what a blessing, what a thrill it is to be a recipient of the grace of God and to have this wonderful hope that because of Jesus, we have a purpose in life now and we have eternal life that is fixed and certain because he has secured our salvation. And when we come to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the apostle, the disciple of Jesus, as he was uh, writing this account about the life of Jesus, it's his purpose, his goal, uh, to show here's Jesus Christ in relationship to Israel. Here's the king of Israel, and this is what he did, this is what he accomplished, and he wants the Jewish Christian to understand here's Jesus Christ and his relationship to Israel as a nation, but here's God's plan for him to come, to die, to be rejected by Israel, and then to have Israel set aside so that God could start the church and bring the gospel to all nations, to Gentiles. And yet he is not done with Israel. He will um, meet his promises to them as a nation in the future. But Matthew wants us to see, he wants the Jewish Christian to see that, yes, your king came. He came the first time, but you rejected him. But that was in the plan of God so that God's grace and mercy should go out through all the world and he could be glorified in saving people from all nations. And so today we're going to look at verses 1 through 17 of the Gospel of Matthew. And when you take a quick glance at that, what do you see? A genealogy. Now everybody's excited, right? <laughs> you know, often when you get to the genealogies in Scripture, uh, the tendency is uh, let's just move on as quick as we can. But I trust that you'll see today that in the Word of God there's nothing that's there for no purpose. That Matthew has a real purpose in the genealogy that he lays out for Jesus Christ. And we'll highlight a couple of those this morning. But when you think of Matthew, you remember that this man was a Jew, but he had left the Jewish religion in order to be a tax collector. Uh, he made the choice. He said, I'm going to go into the business of collecting taxes from my own countrymen. I'm going to do it for Rome. And in so doing, he also was in a position that the tax collectors could cheat the people out of their money and make themselves very rich. So Matthew was a person who was hated by his own countrymen, uh, but he had sold out for the purpose of money. We also know that one day Jesus approached him as he was collecting taxes and he saved him. He said, follow me. Matthew immediately got up, as the Bible says, he left all, rose up, and he followed Jesus. After that moment, it says that Matthew provided a feast where he invited all the other tax collectors and other people, and he wanted them to know about Jesus. And so he had this big dinner invited these other tax collectors, other people, to tell them, here's Jesus. Here's the one that you should know about. And if you recall what happened to the Pharisees, that's when they accused Jesus of spending time with evil people like tax collectors. And so this is the man, Matthew, who then went on to follow Jesus for three years of Christ's earthly ministry. And then he witnessed Jesus' death he was a part of the group who saw the resurrected Jesus for 40 days, uh, was taught by Jesus as well. And then the church began at Pentecost, and Matthew was in the center of all that as one of the apostles, and he was a part of the church beginning. And he is explaining in the Gospel of Matthew, here's Jesus, the King of Israel, in relationship to God's plan, to take the gospel to all nations. And so he begins with the genealogy of Jesus, and it's addressing the Jewish mind. But how does he end his gospel? 
well, the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And so when we look at the birth of Jesus uh, through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, it's, again, fascinating to see the hand of God in the plan for Jesus to die, to save sinners, to spread the Gospel. And so verse 1, it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy. And this is what Matthew wants them to see as he begins with the genealogy. And if you remember, the nation of Israel, the Jews, were looking forward and anticipating their Messiah, their king to come according to Old Testament scripture. And it was their understanding or their thinking that when Jesus or the Messiah came, he would take them out from underneath the rule of Rome. He would honor his promises and they would rule with him uh, over the world. And so they're looking for that promised Messiah. And so he's writing the book of the genealogy of Jesus to point out to the Jew, your Messiah did come. He did come, but he came for a different reason at the first coming. And so we see here the book of the genealogy of Jesus, and it's also pointing out that he's the descendants of Jesus, that he is the Christ, he is the king. His genealogy shows that he has met the requirements coming through David, coming through Abraham. And so he wants them to realize, now here's Jesus. He was your king. He was the promised Messiah. And he also states here, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, Israel knew that their promised king, their promised Messiah, would be through the line of David, and of course would have to be a Jew from Abraham. And so Mo here Matthew is making sure they understand the fulfillment of the throne of David. Uh, he, Jesus, is in that line. Uh, he is fulfilling prophecy. And so he is a descendant from David. And so in Matthew here, it's important for the Jew to understand that, that the son of David, the Messiah, that he would come through that line of David and God provided that eternal throne through David that was promised uh, to Israel. And he would be a righteous branch. He would be one who would deliver Israel from foreign oppressors and return the land to Israel. Now, Jesus, you might say, well, he came. That didn't happen. Well, that was not God's intention at that time. And that's what Matthew is putting before them. But it's God's intention in the future that he will honor uh, that promise to Israel. And it's interesting in the light of today's world events, and you look at the nation of Israel in the center of all that, uh, we know from Scripture what is going to occur. Well, the rapture of the church, and then God is going to turn his attention back to Israel. And there will be the tribulation period, and then Jesus Christ will come as their king, and he will rule on this earth. But Matthew is making sure they understand that the first time that he came, he came to die. He came to provide salvation for all the world, which was promised as well. And the fulfillment of Abraham's lineage. Uh, that was the promise of the Abrahamic covenant, that through Abraham would come the Savior who would provide salvation to whom? To all nations, not just to Israel, but to all nations. And so he's laying out this genealogy so that the Jewish people could see he was the Messiah. He's in the line of David. He's in the line of Abraham, making him a true Jew, but also making him the Savior in the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant that it would be a message that would go to all people and God would save people from all nations. And so Matthew makes it clear, right in verse 1, right from the outset of this verse, that he's a descendant of Abraham, 
He's in the line of David, and he has come, and he came to bring salvation to the whole world. And so Matthew begins in verse 1 uh, to make sure that they understood that Jesus was their promised Messiah, and thus the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy came to be in Jesus, and then he lays out a genealogy, a record, establishing Jesus' claim to the throne of David. And as you look at this list of people, a uh, couple things to keep in mind, a Jewish genealogy did not list every single person. And so he chooses 14 generations to bring in, to play, and he selects different people in the line of Abraham and David and Christ to bring out points that he wants to make. And one of the points that he's making to the Jew, and one of the things that we are to take away from this genealogy is this, is that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. He wants the Jewish mind, the Jewish person to realize they are God's chosen nation. But it's God's intention to save people from all different nations. And so he develops a genealogy that brings that truth out. And it's kind of interesting. It would have been shocking for the Jew to read through this to see how it was written. Because he does bring out some people who were in the line of Christ, rightfully so, but it, they would have been left out by the normal Jewish genealogy, and we'll point those out. But Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. That's what the Jewish Christian needed to understand. That's what the church, when it began, needed to understand, that they are to go to all nations, Jews and Gentiles. And so he's the Savior of all men, including sinful men. And when you look at this list, Matthew uh, has chosen to bring out the fact that here's a list of people, and when you look at their life, you can find sinners saved by grace. Sinners who have known saving grace, who have put their faith in, in God's plan of salvation. And so as he mentions people, you can even start with Abraham right at the beginning. Who was Abraham before God saved him? If you remember, Abraham, according to Scripture, was a polytheist. He worshipped many gods. He was a pagan. He did not know the one true God. And then the Bible says that God came and took him, brought salvation to him. And Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham, by faith, believed in God. So by grace through faith, Abraham, who was a pagan worshiping many gods, he experienced that saving grace. And Matthew brings that out with the list of different people. And if you study the different people, you see what? Over and over again, salvation by grace through faith of sinners. And so he wants them to begin to see that God saves sinful men. And you can also see that the Savior is full of grace and full of mercy. As you look at this list, you see the grace of God and the mercy of God brought, brought forth. And it's interesting to see this being brought to the Jewish mind. You remember the Jewish uh, tradition, the men would pray, thank you, Lord, that I'm not a Gentile or what? Or a woman. Uh, that was the Jewish mindset. Um, you know, Gentiles, you know, they're, they're to be hated. Uh, they're not Jews. They're not as good as we are. Women have a second category below men. And here's Matthew addressing that by whom he selects here that we'll see here in a moment. But Jesus Christ came to the earth so that the gospel could go forth and it would be clear that his grace and mercy was to be shown to all nations and men and women. And it's interesting, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, 
What's happening? Paul has to show the church. He has to write those believers and say, in Christ, there's no Jews, there's no Gentiles, we are one in Christ. There is neither bond nor free. There's not you know, status symbols and social uh, lines that we draw within the church. We're all one, bond or free. And there is neither male or female. God's saving grace is for all. And we are all one in Jesus Christ. And so what Matthew is doing in his genealogy, and we'll see this more in a moment, he wants the early church, he wants especially the Jewish Christians, but all of us to know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He is the King of Israel. But he came the first time in God's plan to set up the church, to set up the gospel going forth to all nations so that he could demonstrate that he saved sinners. And it's by his grace and his mercy that Jews, Gentiles, bond or free, men or women, are found in Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And so God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ is for all. And that's what Matthew is bringing out. And one of the ways that he does it is he chose four women to place in the genealogy of Jesus. And you think of that. This is going to the Jewish Christian. It's addressing them. He hits them with the reality. Here's four women who are Gentiles who are in the genealogy of Jesus. That's going to get their attention. It's also meant to cause them to understand this is God's plan of bringing glory to himself. This is the way we must be thinking and operating. And so he, he chooses these different women. Verse 3, he chose Tamar to be in the genealogy. Verse 5, Rahab and Ruth. And then verse 6, the wife of Uriah, with his, which is Bathsheba. And all four of them were objects of the forgiveness of God. And all four of them were Gentiles, and they had issues that were biblically known that were showing that it would take the forgiveness of sin, the grace and mercy of God, to bring salvation to them and put them in the line of Christ. And when you look at this, this list, all but Ruth were involved in sinful scandals. Uh, there, there were issues that are clearly brought out in Scripture. And Tamar and Rahab and Bathsheba, they were chosen by Matthew, led by the Holy Spirit, to demonstrate Christ's power to forgive. And as you think of your own salvation, we are to understand what? I, I'm a sinner against God. We've all sinned. There's none righteous, not one of us. And yet, what do we know? By the grace of God, the mercy of God, the work of Christ, we have that assurance that all of our sins are forgiven. Praise God for it. That's what the gospel is all about. That's what the church is all about. God saving sinners. And so he's bringing forth those people so that they can see, here's the grace and the mercy of God. They're in the line of the Messiah. They've known that grace and mercy. And so a holy God reveals that saving grace that results in forgiveness, that results in faith, in being able to see who God is. Also, all four examples are examples of working out God's will. Uh, each one of those ladies was in the center of God's plan for their life, and it's amazing to see what he did in saving them. You think of Rahab. You know, remember the story, the account of Rahab in the Old Testament? She was from Jericho. She was not a Jew. She somehow, God enabled her, God brought the truth about who he was to her mind and to her thoughts. And then the Holy Spirit of God brought salvation to her. And then we know the rest of the story and what happened. Well, she converted to being uh, one of God's people. Then she had a husband. She had children. 
and she's in the line of Christ. And what is that speaking of? Well, God was in control. God brought forth an example for all to see that he's in the business of saving Gentiles. He's in the business of saving women. He's in the business of forgiving sinners of sin. Praise God for it. And so he was doing that uh, to bring honor and glory to his name. And here's Matthew, and he says, I'm, I'm throwing these four women into the genealogy of Jesus so that a message can be sent, that the church is all about taking the gospel to all people. And it's the forgiveness of sins found in Christ. It's the grace and mercy of God found in the gospel that all people need to hear, that this is the way of salvation. There is no other, but this is God's plan for the nation of Israel, for Gentiles, that the church is established and for today. And we are to take that gospel message to all people. He also, in his genealogy, as he concludes in verse 16, he brings out the Savior as a virgin birth. And as you look at this, again, don't miss the word of God and what Matthew is bringing forth. It says, verse 16, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, the Messiah. Here's a major point that Matthew makes in his conclusion in his genealogy. You might say, here's the list, and there's much more that you can look at in the lives of these people here. But as he goes through the genealogy, he mentions 14 generations that he chooses but as he concludes, it's a highlight. It's a grand finale of a truth that is essential for the gospel, that is essential for all people to know, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And so he writes it in a way to bring that out. You know, it says here, Mary of whom was born Jesus. There is no earthly father mentioned as having begotten Jesus. And so that is by design, Mary of whom was born Jesus. Everyone else in the list was begotten by a man. You can see the other ladies that are brought out here. It always says they had children begotten by a human father. For example, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. But when he gets to verse 16, that is changed. So with Mary, there was a virgin birth of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, there is no human father to be listed to say, begotten of. And so it's very essential to the gospel, very essential to the truth of who Jesus Christ is, that he was born of a virgin. And if we understand the virgin birth, we should ask, you know, why is it necessary for Jesus to be born of a virgin, not to be begotten by a human earthly father? Well, some of the main reasons for that, uh, that you should know that Matthew would want the reader to know, uh, that by the virgin birth, Jesus Christ is able to be fully God and fully man. And so the virgin birth is essential truth because it's the basis for which Jesus is fully God and fully man. Also, it explains how he could be without the sin that is passed down from one generation to the next. Uh, for we have all sinned. We're all born sinners. Jesus Christ, with his virgin birth, that means he did not have that passed down to him. Uh, he obviously is God, and he is without sin. It also emphasizes that you have a sovereign God who's in control. Uh, the Godhead with Jesus Christ, his plan was for him to come, to be God in the flesh, to be able to go to the cross, to die on the cross, to represent mankind as man, and to be the perfect sacrifice as sinless God. And so as you look at the sovereign plan of God in laying out 
this plan of salvation, it is to cause us to marvel at what God has done to bring glory to his name. And we are the recipients of that grace, that mercy, that love, that plan. And we realize that it's not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, because here, but simply here's God's plan to bring glory to himself in sending Jesus, born of a virgin, in order to be the perfect sinless sacrifice for sinners. And so Matthew, he's making very sure that as the reader goes through that genealogy of Jesus, that they're seeing that he was in the line of David. That's what the Messiah needed to be. He was from Abraham. Therefore, he was a true Jew. Also, he was the one promised to Abraham that would bring salvation to many people. And so Matthew wants them to see that. He's also directing their thoughts away from the Jewish normal way of thinking that we're the Jew people of God, we're special, and no one else is. And he's directing them to the gospel message that is to go to all nations, men and women, and that God's plan is to bring salvation so that Christ could be glorified. And then he's also bringing out the fact that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. That truth is essential to the gospel. That truth is laid out clearly in scripture. Uh, it's not just a part of a Christmas story, but it's a foundational truth to the gospel message that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Uh, that she came to be carrying Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, plus nothing, minus nothing. So when you look at the genealogy uh, here in Matthew chapter 1, you know, it's easy just to fly through it and say, well, that, you know, that's meant there just for making it difficult to read all these names. You notice we didn't do scripture reading today? <laughs> but there is... There's so much more here, too, uh, that you can find in these different people. But I hope that you can see that Jesus Christ is the King of Israel. Uh, that is true. And he's going to be the King of Israel, and he's going to honor his promises to them when he rules on this earth. In the meantime, as Matthew learned, as Matthew was a part of the church as it began, as he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he wants all of us, he wants the church to know today, as God's word declares, that today is the age of grace and it's the age of the church. This is the time in which we are to take the gospel to all nations. And we have that opportunity, we have that privilege, as we have that mindset that as Jesus Christ commanded us, as you are going, as you are living your life as a follower of Jesus, make sure you're looking to share Jesus Christ and the salvation that's found in him. And with whom do we share it? Everyone. Uh, men, women, poor, rich, Jews, Gentiles, they need to hear about Jesus. And that's Matthew's point, and that's Matthew's encouragement that we see that wonderful, marvelous plan of God and that it does not just cause us to, well, let's sing our Christmas songs, let's get through the Christmas season. But let me encourage you this year for Christmas, look at the salvation that you have in Christ. Ask God to show you more about his plan of saving sinners. And it's there. You don't capture the, the truth one day and say, well, I've mastered everything as to what God has done in saving me. It is something that you grow more and more to see and appreciate that salvation, that plan. And when we get to eternity, guess what? It's going to continue. We're going to continue to learn more and more about the grace and the love and the mercy of God, the salvation that we have in Christ. So this Christmas season, make that your heart's desire and prayer. Lord, show me more about who you are. Teach me more about my Savior, Jesus. 
and what he has done in bringing salvation to me. And I know that if you make that your prayer, God's going to cause you to marvel, to be amazed more and more of what he has done through Christ for you. And then also look to share the gospel. Uh, look to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the Christmas season, you look up the statistics, and they say it's one of the times of the year where people are most depressed and suicides go up. And, and you look and say, well, you know, how does that happen? Well, without Jesus, they have no hope. And all the pressures of the season come sweeping down upon them. Well, guess what we have? We have the hope. Uh, we have the good news of salvation in Christ, and we should look to share that with family, friends, uh, neighbors, strangers, uh, to talk about Jesus and who this one is that came into this world and to explain God's plan of salvation found in Christ. Father, we praise and thank you for the wonderful plan of salvation that you have drawn up that you are carrying out to bring glory to your name. And we are thankful that we are recipients of that saving grace. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, see even more about Jesus, that your plan for history centers around Jesus, that your plan of salvation is all about Jesus, that our hope for the future is based upon Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we would grow in our knowledge and our love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that it would fill our hearts with hope, that it would fill our hearts with that peace and joy. And Lord, I pray that it would cause us also to look to share Jesus Christ with others. And when we think of that early church as it began in Jerusalem, and as those Jewish believers began to learn more and more about God's plan of taking the gospel to all men, and as they carried forth that, uh, that purpose that you had for them, as you taught them uh, your plan, Lord, I pray that this local church would have that in mind as well, that your purpose for us is to share the good news of salvation to all people. And Lord, we would look for you to bring salvation to sinners so that you can receive all the glory and all the praise. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's close our time together in prayer. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, and we pray, Lord, that during this Christmas season that we would sincerely come and adore him. And we thank you for the ability to worship him, to learn more of him, to become more like Christ through the grace of God. And we thank you for the word of God that you have given to us to uh, reveal truth about yourself, to teach us more about Jesus, and may we be in the word of God, learning more about Christ and our salvation and giving him all the glory and all the praise. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.